The intro to summer scouting continues. Is the 2024 wide receiver class 10 times better than what we saw in during the 2023 NFL draft? We're going to rank and talk about these guys and look at them from a variety of aspects next on the Locked On NFL Draft Podcast. You are Locked On NFL Draft, your daily podcast covering the NFL Draft. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Locked On family? Welcome back to the Locked On NFL Draft Podcast, your daily podcast covering your favorite draft prospects. Part of the Locked On. Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your boy, Damian Parson, always on the ones and twos. You can find me on Twitter at DP underscore NFL. I'm a national scout with the Draft Network and your favorite and local running back guru. And as always, the champ is here, Mr. LSU himself, my boy, Keith Sanchez. You can find him on Twitter at The Talent Code. Keith, talk to him, baby. What's up, Locked On family? This is Keith Sanchez, Senior Draft Analyst with the Draft Network, man, and 2019 National Champ. Yes, with those LSU Tigers, man, but you know why we're here. We're here to bring championship-level content surrounded the NFL draft. Like we say, the draft don't stop, baby. The draft don't stop. So we're talking 2024, and this is intro, right? So yesterday we went over the quarterbacks, kind of talked about the, the contenders, the the. QB1, some guys that may sneak up on you, um, that your team may have to draft next year, right? But this time we're going to get into those playmakers. Yes, the guys outside, the wide receivers, the guys that are making 30 mil per year now in the NFL, man. So, DP, I want to kick this off with the wide receiver one conversation, right? Not who is wide receiver one, but kind of the main names and then some surrounding names. So, we know that Marvin Harrison Jr., he is the toast of the town right everybody's talking about him he's the best wide receiver since throwing any hall of fame name right (laughs) i have a question dp are there any contenders right in the sense of the fact of is his teammate emeka egbuka somebody that can contend for that number one receiver spot first of all before I get in there, I want to give a quick shout out to our everydayers, man. Thank y'all for making Locked On NFL Draft your first listen every day, Monday through Friday. Uh, but but to that question, Keith, I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm gonna say it's not outside of the realm of possibilities because at the end of the day, it's all about preference, right? It's all like, the taste of the town, what you prefer. I remember what, what I can't remember the year, but it was a year with Jerry Judy, C.D. Lamb, Henry Ruggs, and all those boys. You know, the boys came into into the draft, right? And I think wide receiver one off the board was who? Henry Ruggs. It wasn't C.D. Lamb. It wasn't Jerry Judy. It, it, you know what I'm saying? It, yeah. it, 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 it caught everybody. It caught everybody off guard because what did the Raiders want? They wanted speed. So when you yeah, look right. at these two receivers, it's like okay, I know what MHJ Marvin Harrison Jr. 6'4", 205. He's probably running around four five. But Emeka Buka is supposedly in between the four three four four range in terms of speed. And his ability after the catch, the explosiveness that he's going to bring to an offense as a quick option, as a in as well as an off, uh, mm-hmm. option down the field as well. So it, it I'm, I'm going to say it's not outside the realm of possibilities, but for a betting man, which I am not, but if I was, I'm not betting that he's going to take wide receiver one from his teammate MHJ. All right, DP, I appreciate you playing the politics, man, and keeping it real political. That was a good answer, right? You know, what the NFL may do, we've seen the NFL do crazy things. We're not talking about the NFL, DP. <laughs> I'm talking to Damian Parsons. In Damian Parsons' opinion, if is Marvin Harrison the runaway wide receiver one in this class? Well, since you were like that, yes, he is. To me, he is, man. I, That's what I the watched this show. That's what I gotta get. If that's what they want to know, I gotta get the people what they want, Keith. I gotta get what they want. Now, I mean, man, MHJ, bro, like nuanced. He he has pretty much all of it, but yeah, trust me. If he ran four, if he goes to the combine next in 2024 of March and and busts a four four, like you know, it won't be any discussions. But I, I don't think he's gonna have that type of speed. But everything else is there the ball skills, the route running, the separation. Um, you know, he's a, he's a really good blocker. He can make, he can uh, create yards after the catch himself as well. A three level receiver play on the outside, any inside, you know, everything. I and mean, you watch him against top tier competition, man. He gave Keely Ringo everything he could handle. 
You know right. what I mean? In, in, in what I call the actual national championship game. Because what we saw versus TCU was not the national championship. So, like, I, in the real national championship game, uh, like, he gave the, he gave that, not just Keely Ringo, anybody they put, that they put across from Marvin Harrison Jr., especially in that first half prior to him getting hurt uh, in the middle, middle portion of that game, if I remember correctly. Uh, but just the ball track, everything's there for him, Keith. So you talk about being the the the, the best friend to a, to a quarterback, a guy that you are the, the security blanket, you're the reliable weapon that, hey, I want to give you 12 targets a game, right? That's the type of guy that you, you draft to give 12 targets a game in your NFL offense because he does everything, and it's in his bloodline, man. His dad is one of the greatest receivers of all time. And typically, Keith, that's so hard for young for young players to – Follow those footsteps, you know what I mean, to, to, to meet that expectation. But if there's one young man I think that can meet that expectation, I think it's Marvin Harrison Jr., Keith. Yeah, and I, I would say this, man, we're talking about his father. He When you watch his approach, right, and just who he is as a person, he has that same type of mentality, right, like just work. Like there's not a lot going on. I'm just putting in work. Like that's not, I don't need to do a lot of talking. I'm just putting in work, right? In the off season, I'm putting in work. Not a lot of social media stuff. I'm just putting in work. And I think that's one of the more intriguing things. And I think when it comes down to these wide receiver battles or positional battles, period, those type of things matter when it comes to the NFL, when it comes to our personal opinion, when it comes to ranking guys and how they will project. But DP, I I mentioned, we mentioned Emeka Ibuka as a potential challenger. Is there anyone that you feel can really jump into that elite tier? Because there are a lot of good wide receivers, and we're going to get into those. But is there one name that stands out to you that's like, this guy can potentially do it? Well, I'm going to tee it right back up to you. A guy that I've seen in in spurts down, you know, in in, in your neck of the woods, Malik Neighbors, Keith. You know, that I watched this young man, you know, against Bama, watched a couple couple, uh, games of him. You know, during the season, like you know, during the draft cycle this year, and, and DBs that he had to face in the SEC because I had a ton of them in my region for 2023, and this was a baller, man. Like everything I saw from explosive, ball skills, everything, Keith. But I know that you watched him a lot closer than I did. What were some of your takeaways when it came down to Malik Neighbors? Was he, is he that, is he really that much better than Keishawn Butte? Ah, we're going to leave a cliffhanger there. Dude. <laughs> into, man. We're definitely going to talk about it, man. But we have yeah. to um, transition to the next segment, man. We're going to talk about that. First up, man, we get into Malik Neighbors and who he is as a prospect, just surface level. And if he does have the potential, from my opinion, to jump into that conversation, it wouldn't be rare territory, right? We're talking about nah. LSU wide receivers, right? That's what we do, man, wide receiver you. So coming up next, man, we're going to get into Malik Neighbors and his potential to challenge for that number one wide receiver position. Guys, if you're looking for a delicious snack but don't want all the sugar and calories and you need to give the best tasting protein bar ever, a try, and that's Built Bar, Built Puffs. If you're like me and you want to make healthier snack choices but you don't want to compromise on taste, which I totally understand, then I got just a thing for you guys. Built Bars and Built Puffs, they're healthy and they taste amazing. And they taste so amazing that you really won't even notice that they're actually good for you. So I promise you, you want to give it a try. What makes Built Bars so good? They are covered in 100% real dark chocolate. You heard me correct, 100% real dark chocolate with unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, as I always tell you, my favorite cookies and cream. So guys, you can do like me, go to your local Walmart and get a four bar box or go to your local Sam's Club and get a bulk Uh, A box of bulk, a 13-bar box of the specialty flavors there. Or you can allow us to help you by going to BuiltBar.com and using our promo code LOCKEDON15, and you'll get 15% off your next order. All right, Keith. Malik Neighbors, (laughs) you on the spot. What's going on? You know when it's a a wide receiver at LSU, I have no problem with having this conversation, right? Um, (laughs) Listen, listen, listen. It's definitely there, man. The the potential is definitely there because I see a guy, um, you know, off initial watch, watching, you know, having watched Kayshawn, he catches your eye to Malik Neighbors. Um, You see a guy short area quickness. You see an explosive guy, a guy that's competitive at the catch point, right? Um, Run after catch ability. Some people down here in this neck of the woods have compared him to Jamar Chase-esque 
in the sense of the fact of because he has that thicker lower body, that thick frame, but he's also an explosive football player. And what that thick frame allows for what? It's hard for cornerbacks to tach, tackle you, right? You're a naturally strong person. You can go across the middle, right? And things like that. So in that in that perspective, I think he can – I would put Dark Horse – for wide receiver one, right? I wouldn't say a just flat out contender, but I would put Dark Horse because I think Marvin Harrison Jr. still has some of the, the measurements, right? The route running and things like that. And then Jane, da- I mean, yeah, LSU with Jane Daniels, we have to see where he stands. So you, Malik Neighbors, I would definitely put as a Dark Horse contender, but DP, let's keep rolling these names, man. We have Johnny Wilson from Florida State. We have Rome Adunze from Washington, what are, what are those names, right? Like, are, are those potential guys that you can see making a lot of noise this upcoming fall and, um, you know, production and being able to elevate themselves? I think so. Um, you know, especially with Romeo Dunze over there in Washington. Michael Penix out there throwing that pigskin around in the Pac-12, That's, man. Yeah. That's gonna it, it's it's going to be a lot. And then he's got a, he's got a teammate in Jalen McMillan that you can't just you, – you, you know what I'm saying? It's, you can't double them. Like, you got to kind of play them honest, man. So, like, they're going to be able to put up a lot of numbers. Uh, You know, a, another three-level type of receiver. Really talented kid, Romeo. But, Keith, Johnny Wilson, like, I, I don't recall any draft that had one six-foot-seven wide receiver. This potential draft has multiple – Six foot seven wide receivers, and Johnny Wilson at Florida State with with Jordan Travis, who we talked about with the quarterback conversation yesterday. I'm really intrigued by him, man. The the because you think about it, right? What's the, what's the quarterback's best friend? That back shoulder fade to their big body receiver. You know what happens with a guy like Johnny Wilson? He can look for the ball and not tell you that the ball is coming. He don't give you no telltales until you just see him just reach back real quick and snatch the ball out of the air. You're not even in position. To turn around. I remember watching the the I think it was from spring training at one of their practices where he caught a back shoulder fade over one of the DBs. Yeah, For yep. one, he made the DB look like he was a high schooler. Keith, this man is <laughs> six foot seven. And I know some people, you know, I'm and I'm gonna ask you, I know some people will look at him and say, Man, do y'all think he is is he a wide receiver or is he a tight end, Keith? So I, I know that you actually because you thought he was gonna come out this previous draft in 2023, and I know you did a scouting report on him for us over at the draft network. What like it is he a wide receiver to you, Keith? Do you think he can live in that position? I think he can live there, but this is the key. I'm okay. gonna throw out a name, right? Mm-hmm. And 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 you have to pick up what I'm putting down. Mm-hmm. Kyle Pitts. Boom. Throw out that name. And the reason I'm throwing that name out is this because we had the same conversation about Kyle Pitts, right? Is this guy a big wide receiver or is he a tight end? Probably measurables, they're probably similar. Kyle Pitts may be. A tad bit more athletic, but Johnny Wilson yeah. is still a really good athlete. And we're talking about the usage, right? You can use them the same exact way. You can align Kyle Pitts on the outside, and if he gets matched up with linebackers or some safeties, it's a clear and obvious mismatch. You see the same thing for Johnny Wilson, 6'7", 230 pounds, right? He can beat linebackers and safeties. Then when you put him, you know, you condense him inside to play in the slot, things like that, various alignments, stack alignments, and all those like you just talked about, right, a big target, but not just a big target on the outside. Now he can work the middle of your field. So I thought about Kyle Pitts, and you thought about the value, because Kyle Pitts, I believe, was the number one – was he the number one receiver threat taken off the board? Like, like I receiver? believe so, I yeah. He was, yeah. In that draft. So this is why you, we have the conversation, right? And, and this is something I'm going to continue to hit home. I'm going to pull up the measurables. But as we were having this conversation, this is something that came up to me. And I'm like, well, hell, if – Kyle Pitts went top four, top five, right? If Johnny Wilson shows the same type of production, athleticism, physically dominant, right? Is there a potential for him to slide into that number one spot? Because people are going to be looking at it. And we know it's key, right? What, what is key is that Kyle Pitts has to has has to have a good year. He's a monkey see, monkey do business when it comes to the NFL personnel, NFL draft and GMs. So if Kyle Pitts has a good year this year, right, with Arthur Smith, then I think you can slide Johnny Wilson's name up the board even more because somebody's gonna try to replicate that. Now I, I like that, Keith. And, and and I remember when I when I was asked about you know Johnny playing tight end, the name I was like, okay, if he does, I'm I'm a believe. This is what I'm a believer in, Keith. Similar to tackle, right? With like a Peter Skaronski or any shorter arm tackle. If it's not like, yeah, you can't have 29 inch arms playing tackle. Like you know what I mean? It's not, nothing crazy like that. But just you you're you're just a you're a little bit shy of that. That threshold, 
I said, you play them at tackle until they fail. If you put them in camp and they succeed, why, why, why not leave them there until they actually fail at that position? And that's how I feel about Johnny Wilson. You let him play wide receiver until he fails, until he, he proves to you he's not a wide receiver. Then, Keith, you brought up Kyle Pitts. I'm going to bring up another name. A, it's not, not a throwback, but, you know, some people might forget. Again, in your neck of the woods, Jimmy Graham when he was yeah. with the Saints. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? If you want to play him at tight end, if that's the desert, direction you want to go once he's in the league, you get a Jimmy Graham S type of player where he was more, he wasn't, Jimmy Graham wasn't a devastating blocker. He was more receiver than blocker, but he was one of the best receiving tight ends that we've seen in such a long time. You yeah. know what I mean? That he's the basketball skills, yeah. the athleticism, everything that he had. So, but I'm with you. I think he can live on the outside. And I think he can live as a receiver. I think you just move him around. Play him outside. You play him inside. You, he's one of those guys that you look at him and you just allow him to be your coverage dictator, where you start motioning him pre-snap and see where they're going with in terms of, in terms of who's covering him. You know what I mean? Like if he's in the if he's out wide, you start moving him around to the opposite side of formation. If that guy travels with Mo Casey, that's letting your quarterback know we got man to man. But if nobody, they just bump down a gap. Okay, we got zone. So it like allow because when you you six seven two thirty. Anytime you walk out of the huddle, baby, you got every – you got all 11 – even the defensive linemen are looking at you like, bro, this dude is bigger than me. Like, you know what I mean? So, like, they, they got eyes on you as well. So, I think that's that's a big thing. But, you know, even in this conversation, we talked about the Mecca. I think a Mecca, you know, like I said, you know, just – this is a – this wide – I'm, I'm going to say this, Keith. This wide receiver class is – Better than the 2023 wide receiver class. You already stamped it. You already. Oh, I'm, I'm stamping that right now, baby. I'm <laughs> stamping that because we walked into the 2023 NFL draft where you got the likes of Jim Nagy and everybody else. Like, man, you know, NFL only got one graded one wide receiver graded as a first round pick. Mind you, I predicted that on our on our preview show that all that the four guys that went in the first round would go in the first round, but it's a film fact of more so needing surplus, right? You know what I mean? So it's like teams needed wide receiver twos. All four of the teams that drafted those receivers got wide receiver twos that some of them could be potentially wide receiver ones. This class is a definite wide receiver one. There's a definite wide receiver two. There's a battle for two. You know what I mean? If MH, if MHJ is one, Keith, then you got the likes of Neighbors, Wilson, Ibuka, Romeo, and there's going to be other guys that's going to pop out. Troy Franklin from Oklahoma. You know, I don't want to get too get too far ahead of ourselves because we still got another segment. But that wide receiver two battle is going to be one, probably one of the more fun battles that we will watch in the 2023 college football season. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and it's the reason of the wide receiver one is such a polarizing name. And then if you ask people, well, who's the second best? People throw their hands up, right? They don't know. Like, and it's, it's just so many names to throw in there. So it's definitely going to be some names that's going to emerge with DP. Listen, man, we, we we almost showed our hand right there, man. We almost showed our hand for the next segment, but you was able to pull it back and we was able to play these cards, man. So coming up next, man, DP almost hinted at it. We're going to go talk about not necessarily wide receivers that can challenge for the wide receiver one position, right? But just depth, guys, because the second round matters, right? The third round matters. The back end of the first round matters. And if we have a talented group, we can see six wide receivers go in this first round. So we want to go deep into the rest of these names, these guys that have shown to already be playmakers, production, you know, they're proven in college football, and now they just need one more year to kind of stamp their names as high-level draft picks. So coming up next, man, we're getting into those guys that not many people are talking about, but they have a shot at challenging for the back end of the first round and second round wide receiver prospects. You know how we, you know what we say, man. It's time to wake them up, Keith, on these sleeper receivers that they need to get to know this summer. Uh, and I, I kind of hinted at them, you know, in the last second, the end of the last second, but Troy Franklin from Oregon, man. Uh, you know, a guy that for Bo Nix, that's his number one receiver. A guy that can stretch the field. He tracks the ball well. Kind of thinner in the frame, uh, you know, in terms of his build. If I remember correctly, Keith, I believe he was, uh, you know, sub 180. He's like 6'3", uh, you know, 178. You know, they projected him re around the 4'3", 4'4". He's a burner. He can take the top off of a defense. But I think he runs good enough routes to separate on his own without the speed aspect being the biggest – uh, proponent of uh, his separate of him creating separation. So a guy that I think could really, you know, really help himself being that number one option with a Bo Nix who's returning. I think them boys already having their chemistry. I'm looking forward to seeing how 
well he can play uh, heading into the 2023 NFL, uh, 2023 college football season and the 2024 NFL draft cycle. Okay, cool. Look, I'm going to kick this thing off, DP. One of my names, man, is it, a guy from Louisiana. That's why I tell you, like, we produce such good athletes, man. It may be the most talented area um, in, in all of the country. <laughs> Oh, uh, but I'm gonna go with Michigan State. Um, he went to Michigan State. Um, is in the transfer portal right now, trying to figure out where he's mm-hmm. gonna go. And that is Keon Coleman. That is a name pull. You talking about God is six three, has a vertical jump out this word, physically impressive um football player. He's just looking for a home. So if he goes to the right place, we're talking Texas with Keon Coleman, right? We're talking Florida State with uh Jordan Travis, we're talking all of these different places. Um, if he gets the production. I think he's another first round S type wide receiver because he has the physical um, attributes to back everything up. The next name I want to bring up, DP, is I'm talking about Texas again. Adonai Mitchell. Speed, speed, speed. Another player that can just take the top off. And man, I, I watch Quinn Ewers, right? I'm, we're in summer scouting now, so I checked him out this morning. Quinn Ewers is the quarterback that can get him the football. He's going to be able yeah. to get him the football. Uh, Steve Sarkeesian with the, the play designs, these three-level, um, you know, these bootleg comp sets that they run, I really like, I really enjoy. Quinn Ewers can deliver the football. He's accurate, ball placement, everything else. So this is another guy you have to watch out. And can I just go third? I'm going to go three for three. Go ahead. Xavier Worthy, once again, Texas. Can y'all wonder where I think Texas may finish in the Big 12, right? All of these doggone playmakers. Um, Another guy, explosive, reminds everybody of who? Hollywood Brown, right? Just, you know, short area quickness, take the top off. Not a very big guy, but he runs routes. He gives it to the defensive backs every single time. You can tell they fear him. Um, So this is another guy that's just, like I said, watch for another name to emerge um, you know, just throughout this process. And I believe with Hollywood Brown, did he go in the first round? Was he a first, first round? He's a first yeah, round. So, as I said, we're still pulling names, right, to where if they have the production, this thing can definitely shift one way or another. But those are my three names, DP, for this, um, you know, that that I kind of feel like, okay, these are some challenging names. I don't know if you have another one or two uh, le- left in, in your bucket. I, I do, Keith. You know, like I said, we, we, we like to, to really showcase the range on this show. Our range is – up there with Steph Curry and Damian Lillard in the NBA. Oh, we shoot okay. from 40 and 50. Well, let you know me see. Pull up from 40 you know, so, so, you know, we, we pulling up from 40 here, Keith. You know, Jacob Cowling over there at Arizona. And and, and the, the, the one of the bigger proponents I've noticed with this wide receiver class, Keith, last year, like we talked about, it was a ton of smaller guys. Oh, this class got size. This class has more 6'2", 6'3", yeah, yeah. receivers. But shout out, I want to give my shorter kings some love. Uh, Jacob Cowing, you know, uh, 5'11", 175, good route runner, legitimate speed, 4'4", type of athlete over at Arizona. And, and, they're, and they kind of run like a spread offense. They, they're going to get the ball to him in space, down the field, all three levels, everything, man. Run after the catch opportunities. A guy over at USC, man, Mario Williams, the, uh, another guy who transferred from Oklahoma, with Lincoln Riley, 5'9", you know, 185 pounds, but another guy that can win with routes, but win with speed. Uh, I think he's more – projects more of like a slot receiver and manufactured touch guy, but something that could be very dangerous in space, Keith. And I, then – I, 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 go I, I, I need to cut you off, but DP, I had – there was something, Keith, I need to point out, man. You said <clears> – <throat> shout out to my short kings, and then you went on to say my guy was 5'11". So, uh, uh, yeah, 5'11", no, no, is yeah. now short now? Like, you, you, for, you just for wide everybody receivers, in. yes. Everybody in together. That's crazy, man. No, no. We it, we don't we don't discriminate. If you sub <laughs> six foot, you, you you a short king, baby. We taking it, man. You know what I'm saying? But no, they, I'm looking at it, man. And, and, and one guy, a name that I want people, like I said, <laughs> pulling up from 40. I want people to understand Moose Muhammad the third, and, and this is Musin Muhammad's son. This young man can ball, guys. I'm telling you right now. And the game that you, if you really want to see what he can do, go to Texas A&M versus Alabama. You see a matchup in the in the slot versus Alabama second round pick Brian Branch, and he was giving Brian Branch everything he could in that game. He was giving them two two piece of biscuit, got a drink on the side. He was giving them everything. And that's when it really caught my eye when I was studying Brian Branch. And I wrote this kid's name down. And I think he's like, of course, Texas has Anaya Smith, who's a converted running back to slot receiver. But I think Moose Muhammad the third should be their wide receiver one for Texas AM. Now, of course, the quarterback situation will be key. But I think 6'1, 195, 
Um, a guy that expected to run in the four four range. This is a young man that's talented, Keith, and he could ball. Like yeah. father, like son. <laughs> now, I was able to get eyes on him a little bit too, watching, you know, just the SEC West, watching Bama, LSU, those teams like that. And and, and Duke could definitely ball. And I remember him from high school. I think he was in the, the North Carolina area out of high school, which makes sense because his, his father played for the Carolina Panthers, right? But definitely a, a talented guy. Um <clears throat> We looked at this list, man. We rattled off maybe 10 to 12 names. And this thing is just getting started. Like I said, we didn't even dive all the way into these guys. This is surface level, right? This is not rankings. This is just ballers, right? And, and we are extremely excited about this class. DP already pounded the table, made his statement. He said, listen, it's only May. It's May 17th, May 16th, May 15th, whatever May it is. And he said that this class is already better than the next year, than last year's class. So I'm excited. Everyone should be excited, man. Playmakers, we know we love those guys that can, you know, just make plays with the footballs in the hand. Of course, of course. I'm stamping it. Damn stampable approval 2024 over 2023. Let's get the campaign going. You know what I mean? I'm on my politician move right now, Keith. But as always, guys, we, we appreciate our love and support. Go subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen uh, to podcasts to get the latest episode as soon as it's available. Thank you all for making Locked On NFL Draft the your first listen today and every day, every Monday through Friday. You know what we tell you. You're not only family to us, but you're, you are our everydayers, and we appreciate and love you all. Uh, in terms of Twitter, you can find Keith Sanchez at the Talent Code. I'm Damian Parson, DP underscore NFL. Come and join the conversation again tomorrow on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.